The propositions for the discussion are resolved. The Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles, as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27, was achieved in the first century. Affirming will be Dr. Dunn Preston, and denying will be Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, I didn't get the precise uh, proposition from Dr. Brown, but uh, he can give that later. But uh, we have the proposition as resolved. The Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles, as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27, is yet to be fulfilled in our future. And affirming that or a similar proposition will be, uh, as we said, Dr. Michael Brown, and denying will be Dr. Dunn Preston. Now, as we introduce our speakers, Dr. Dunn Preston will be first, I believe, in the discussions. Dr. And, Brown. Um, Dr. Preston is the founder and president of the Preterist Research Institute, which is a nonprofit institute dedicated to the positive proclamation of the good news and that we are not in the last days uh, and the world is not just about to end. He is also the author of over 22 books, I lose count all the time, all on the subject of Preterist eschatology and has debated many leading evangelicals, including James Jordan, Joel McDermott, C. Marvin Pate, David Englishma, Randall Price and Thomas Ice. He has served as the minister for the Ardmore family of God, formerly the Ardmore Church of Christ, for 16 years. Also, Dr. Michael Brown is the founder and president of Fire School Ministry in Concord, North Carolina. He is the director of the Coalition of Conscious. He hosts the daily national syndicated uh, talk show, The Line of Fire. Dr. Brown holds a PhD in Near Eastern languages and literature from New York University. He has served as a visiting adjunct, or adjunct professor of Southern Evangelical Seminary, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary of Charlotte, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Fuller Theological Seminary, Denver Theological Seminary, the King's Seminary, and Regent University School of Divinity. He has contributed numerous articles to scholarly publications, including the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion and the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament. Dr. Brown is the author of 22 books, and that as well may have changed since his last debate. Uh, at this time, we want to give the format for the discussion. Dr. Preston will be going first. Each man will have 17 minutes each to make his case followed by a 12-minute rebuttal by each man, and the same order will follow all the way through the debate. Then each man will have 15 minutes each for a cross-examination to ask the other questions, and the debate will close with each man having a five-minute closing statement. Now, the cross-examination should consist of asking questions, not of starting positions, uh, or responding to answers from the previous or last question uh, should be very much focused on asking of questions and any other uh, commentary that you might have outside of laying the groundwork uh, for the question briefly is considered out of bounds. Uh, and I want to ask, do you gentlemen agree with those rules as stated? Indeed. Okay, sure very good. <laughs> All right, so we're going to set the clock. And Brother Preston, you may begin. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Brown, let me first of all express my appreciation for being with you again and uh, having this debate. I know, I know what tremendous interest the very first debate we had has, has garnered. Almost 24,000 people have watched it. I know that we're not going to be able to cover all of the bases in today's presentation, so perhaps we can even plan on future discussions. When we are talking about the fullness of the Gentiles, and of course we had actually discussed discussing the times of the Gentiles as well, and so I, I will include that in part of my affirmative here. But before we can really begin to discuss the fullness of the Gentiles, we really have to discuss the blindness of Israel because that's how Paul prefaces his statement concerning the fullness of the, of the Gentiles. He said, blindness in part has happened unto Israel. I think it's critical to understand that any time the Bible really discusses the blindness of Israel, is in the context of an imminent judgment that was about to take place. For instance, in Psalm 69, a passage quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 11, let their table become a snare unto them, let their well-being be a trap, let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, make their loins tremble, pour out your indignation upon them, let your wrathful anger overtake them, let their, desolate, uh, let their habitation be desolate, 
because they add iniquity to, to iniquity, they add sin to sin, and they shed innocent blood. All of these things are found right there in Romans chapters 9 through 11. So Paul's just not pulling uh, Psalms chapter 69 out of thin air. He has a very definite prophetic background and source in mind. This blindness of Israel always led to imminent judgment. It is interesting and significant that in Isaiah chapter 6, 9 and following, the prophet was told to go and preach to the people. And yet Yahweh said, this people's eyes, they have closed. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their hearts are wax gross. Lest at any time they see, they hear, be converted and healed, and I should and be, be healed. And I, Isaiah said, well, Lord, how long do I have to go to this blind people? How long do I have to go and preach? And the message was, until the cities lie waste. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus began to teach in parables, and the disciples came to him and said, why are you teaching in parables? Jesus' response was, because it is given unto you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom, but to them it is not given, that in them it might be fulfilled, and he quotes Isaiah chapter 6. Likewise, in John chapter 12, 38 to 40, Jesus cites Isaiah chapter 6, 9 through 11. Now, any good Jew would understand at that time that if Jesus was saying that Israel of his day was blind and refused to see, guess what? Judgment was coming. It is significant that in Acts chapter 28, as Paul is in Rome in prison, he calls the leaders of the Jews to him. He preaches to them about the hope of Israel, about the kingdom of God, and Jesus is their Messiah. Some believed, some did not. When, when Paul perceived that they were not believing, he said, Brethren, beware lest it come on you, which is spoken of by the prophets. And guess what? He quotes Isaiah chapter 6, 9 to 11. They knew full well that if they were being accused of being blind, as those in Isaiah's, Isaiah's day were accused of being blind, they knew judgment was coming. But you see, even in those contexts of judgment, salvation was around the corner at the same time for the righteous remnant. So the first point I want to make is that when Paul says blindness in part has happened at Israel, he's not talking about 2,000-year blindness. He's not talking about something to be protracted. He is saying that Israel of his day was blind and that that meant, obviously, judgment was coming. It is significant that this salvation that was coming, as I pointed out in the first debate, was, was taken from Isaiah 27 and Isaiah 59, both of which passages just like Isaiah chapter 69 did, accuse Israel of shedding innocent blood. Israel would be judged for shedding innocent blood at the time of her salvation, and Jesus unequivocally posited that time of judgment, and thus the time of salvation, at the time of the judgment of Israel and Jerusalem in AD 70. Well, let's move on just a little bit for time consideration. When we look at the term, the fullness of the Gentiles, I believe that we really, really have to focus on Paul's ministry. There's no question that Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And he even said, I magnify my office as an apostle to the Gentiles. It's significant that we look at Colossians chapter 1, 24 through 27. Paul said, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh that which is lacking in the sufferings of Christ on your behalf for, which is the church, the church, which is the body of Christ, according to the administration or according to the stewardship of the ministry which God gave to me on your behalf, the church, to fulfill the word of God, the mystery. You have to catch the power of this, folks. Paul said, and by the way, in the Greek, this is in the emphatic mode. Paul said, I... I, Paul, I personally have been given the administration, the stewardship, to complete the mystery of God. What's the mystery of God? Jew and Gentile equality in Christ. Let's go back and look at that word fullness in Romans chapter 11. Some translations render Romans 11.25 until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Well, number is not inherent in that Greek word. It is the Greek word pleroma. It is used some 17 times in the New Testament. It does not ever inherently demand numeric fullness. And let me illustrate. Colossians chapter 1, it pleased God that in him, that is in Christ, all of the fullness would dwell. 
In him, that is in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 11, verse 12, if the cutting off of Israel be the fullness, play Roma, of the Gentiles, then how much more shall their acceptance, that is Israel's acceptance, be but life from the dead? Very clearly, Paul is not talking numerically here. He is talking about a qualitative fullness, that is, the full equality of Jew and Gentile in one body in Christ. Thus, Paul defined the mystery of God as equality between Jew and Gentile in one body in Christ in Ephesians chapter 3. Now, since Paul said that it was his personal distinctive stewardship to fulfill, play Roma, the word of God, the mystery, and Paul in Romans chapter 11 said that the salvation of Israel would come at the time of the fullness of the Gentiles, then that means that the fullness of the Gentiles and thus the salvation of uh, of Israel is tied to the end of Paul's ministry. It's tied to Paul's ministry temporally. And Paul said, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 16 to 18, when he stood before Nero, that it was it, it was at that time that his ministry would be fulfilled, play Roma, and that all the Gentiles would hear the word of God. We find all of these texts using the same word, play Roma, fill, uh, concerning the same concept, and it's a qualitative fullness, Jew and Gentile in one body, and Paul said that fullness of the Gentiles belonged to his personal ministry. Well, since we had originally talked about in our discussions, and one of the propositions actually read, I guess I didn't send it to William, about the times of the Gentiles in Luke chapter 21, 24, I do want to spend a little bit of time on that. Because it's my understanding, Dr. Brown can certainly correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Dr. Brown uh, conflates those two ideas and, and believes that they're same. I do not believe that. Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are brought in. Dr. Brown believes that at the end of the time of the Gentiles, that means that Luke 21, 24 is saying that Israel would be saved at that time. Well, I believe that that brings in Romans 11.25, but I don't believe that they're one and the same thing. And let me illustrate. The times of the Gentiles is, I believe, the period of time devoted by God, determined by God, to accomplish the full destruction and the full covenantal end of Old Covenant Israel. I don't believe, therefore, that Luke chapter 21 and 24 was predicting a change of status like Luke, or like Romans chapter 11 would hint, hint at. And here's the reason why. Jesus said, Jerusalem shall be trodden down. The term that is used, or the word that is translated as trodden down, is from pateo. Pateo is only used five times in the New Testament. It's used several times in the Septuagint. But pateo never refers to a geopolitical domination of a people with long periods of peace. The word pateo means active military warfare. Let me illustrate. In the Septuagint, in Lamentations 1 and verse 17, the, the prophet was writing immediately after the fall of Jerusalem. He is writing dur during a period of time of geopolitical domination, of, of Israel on the part of Babylon. However, he did not view that as pateo. He looked back on it, and in Lamentations 1.17, he said, Lord, you have appointed a time for the nations to come in and to tread down. The nations have, have past tense, trodden down your people according to your appointed times. They have trodden them down like grapes in the wine press. Now watch this. Jesus said Jerusalem will be trodden down until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. In Revelation chapter 11, John saw a vision of the holy city, the holy city that he describes as the city, quote, where the Lord was slain, and that holy city would be trodden down, pateo, for how long? Time, times, and a half time, three and a half years. How long did the siege of Jerusalem last? Three and a half years. This is not mere coincidence. Let me emphasize this point. Pateo does not refer to 2,000 years since A.D. 70. It does not refer to a time of mere geopolitical domination. It refers to an active military time of active warfare. 
let me conclude my presentation. William, how much time do I have there? But let me conclude my presentation here with a final look at the term times of the Gentiles. And folks, you just really, really need to catch the power of this. Any time Israel was involved in an active downtrodding by foreign countries, it was as a direct violation, as a result of the direct violation of Torah, of the law of Moses. Leviticus 26, the law of blessings and cursing, Deuteronomy 28 to 30. God said, you violate this covenant, the law of Moses, I will send you off into foreign countries. There you will be captives. That, that is a direct result of violation of Torah. Now, the question is, is the law of Moses is still, still in effect? Let me put it like this. If, in fact, the times of the Gentiles began or continued in Luke 21 or in A.D. 70, then of necessity the law of Moses, every jot and every tittle, is still binding today. Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth passes away, not one jot, not one tittle shall pass from the law until it is all fulfilled. Well, the trotting down of Israel was a direct result of, consequence of, fulfillment of the covenantal sanctions against Israel for Israel's violation of Torah. <clears throat> Torah was done away with in A.D. 70. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13, the writer said that the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, was, quote, nigh unto passing away. Now, if the law of Moses, not some of it, not just a little bit of it, not even a majority of it, but if the law of Moses in its entirety passed away in the first century, then the times of the Gentiles cannot be in effect. If a law or a covenant has been annulled, none of its promises, none of its penalties are applicable after the time of its annulment. So if we argue that the times of the Gentiles, and argue we must if we're going to make that argument, if we are going to say that the times of the Gentiles and the treading down of, uh, of Israel is a covenantal sanction, as Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28 to 30 says it would be, then of necessity, if the times of the Gentiles were in existence in A.D. 70, then that, guess what? Torah was in effect in A.D. 70. And furthermore, if Jerusalem is still under the times of the Gentiles, then every iota of Torah, the law of Moses, that means the animal sacrifices, that means the feast days, that means the Sabbaths are all absolutely binding on the Jews. Now, my good friend Dr. Brown told us in our last debate he does not observe the Sabbath. He does not offer animal sacrifices. Why? Well, because he believes the law of Moses has been done away with. Well, folks, let me reiterate. You have to catch the power of this. If the law of Moses has been done away with, then the sanctions against Israel, i.e. times of the Gentiles, the treading down of Jerusalem that was described by Jeremiah in Lamentations 117, the law, if the law of Moses has been done away with, if it has been co completely fulfilled, then the times of the Gentiles ended of necessity at the time that the law of Moses passed away. So let me summarize what I've tried to point out here. Paul begins his discussion of the salvation of Israel by pointing out, number one, a cup three times in Romans chapter 11 that Israel was blind at that time. But historically, prophetically, and biblically, the blindness of Israel was always couched in the terms of imminent judgment. Was salvation associated with that judgment? Yes, for the remnant just as Paul taught in Romans 9 through 11. In Isaiah chapter 6, blindness had happened unto Israel. In that, at that time, imminent judgment was coming. In Matthew 13 and in Acts chapter 28, both Jesus and Paul spoke of the blindness of Israel at that time, which was the same time period of Romans chapter 11, but that meant that judgment was coming imminently, but salvation of Israel would come at the same time. We've talked about the fullness of the Gentiles and how it was Paul's distinctive personal stewardship belonging to his ministry to bring in, to complete, to fulfill the Word of God, the mystery, which is Jew and Gentile equality 
in Christ. We have demonstrated that from the Greek word pleroma, and thus the fullness of the Gentiles belongs to, the, to Paul's personal ministry. We have demonstrated that the times of the Gentiles cannot be a long period of time because the word pateo demands an active military time of warfare. That has happened for the last 2,000 years. And the times of the Gentiles belongs to a period of time in which Torah would be effective. If the times of the Gentiles are in effect right now, the law of Moses, every jot and every tittle is still in effect. And I'll close it at that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brother Preston. You had about 11 seconds left, but we appreciate you uh, staying uh, with the time. And now we are ready for Dr. Brown's speech. Give me just a second to reset the clock. Uh, Dr. Brown, are you ready? And if you'll notice, I didn't mention it before, but in the right-hand side, if you can see it, I am placing the time markers there, so there's a little chat box. Uh, can you note? Did you notice that? You know, I've, I've got a clock in front of me. So okay, I'm, well, I'm, I'm sure. I know because I listen to your other debate. You get them down to the point of a second, a tenth of a second. All right. Well, Dr. Brown, we're going to let you go at this time. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Preston, I appreciate the presentation and the passion behind it. Uh, what I'll demonstrate is not a single point was demonstrated by Dr. Preston, either in the Greek or in the overall plain sense of the text, even in English. Uh, just a little background. I was very happy to do the debate on Romans 11.26, and all Israel shall be saved uh, because of the issues having to do with the hope of the Jewish people and the salvation of my people Israel. And therefore, I felt it was important to do. Uh, I really had no interest in debating the meaning of the fullness of the Gentiles, but out of respect for Dr. Preston and the scholarship that he's put into this and the interest in our first debate, I agreed to do it and really learn more of what Dr. Preston's position is just as I listen now which reinforces all the more uh, to me the complete wrongness of that position based on the plain sense of Scripture. So we start in Romans 9 through 11. We remember that this is a foundational letter, Romans, that Paul wrote uh, to the believers there to make sure that they understood foundational principles of the gospel. And one big question is what happened to Israel? There were promises given to Israel. The, uh, the thought was they would receive their Messiah and make him known to the nations. That didn't happen. The great majority of the people didn't believe. Paul agonizes over that. He said part of the answer is there's a remnant, there's an Israel within Israel, Romans 9, 6, that has believed. But then he addresses the question, what about the rest of the nation? What about everybody else? And he takes this up and says in Romans, the 11th chapter, verse 11, I ask then, have they stumbled in order to fall? Who? The nation as a whole. Not the remnant, the nation as a whole. Absolutely not. On the contrary, by their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. So this is part of the role of the Gentile believers, to make Israel jealous. Has that happened through church history? No. To the contrary, Gentiles have often driven Jewish people away from the gospel. Church history is replete with crusades and inquisitions, even leading straight up to the Holocaust. Many Jews associate the Holocaust with Christianity. Why? Because the church, the Gentiles, have failed to make Israel envious. But this is part of the goal, part of Paul's long-term vision for the Gentiles. Now, he says this, uh, Now, if their stumbling brings riches for the world, and their failure, riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their fullness bring? So he's speaking first of the fullness of, the, 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 of Israel here in Romans 11. And he's saying that that will bring something far beyond what we have seen so far. Has that yet happened? Absolutely not. We have not yet seen the fullness of Israel quite clearly on a thousand different levels observationally and scripturally as well. We've not yet seen that. We've not yet seen the fullness of Israel, which with that would bring this massive thing to the earth that has not been here yet. So if we have seen the salvation that has come through Israel rejecting the Messiah and the gospel going to the nations, what happens when Israel receives the Messiah? There are numerous Old Testament texts that speak of the glory of that day and what it will bring to the entire world. If you take a picture like Isaiah, the 11th chapter, whether you take it metaphorically that the wolf lying down with the lamb speaks of nation, at peace with nation, whether you take it literally, we've not yet seen that. 
There is still war. There is still strife on the earth. A picture of Isaiah, the second chapter, where the nations come streaming to Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel, and there's no more war, and there's universal peace on the earth. We have not yet seen that. We have not seen the new heavens and the new earth that Revelation describes. Will there be no pain, no sorrow? There's no possible fair interpretation of these scriptures that could say that these things have already happened. But look at what Paul says. Now I'm speaking to Gentiles in view of the fact that I'm an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If I can somehow make my own people jealous and save some of them. So this is his immediate goal to save some. Why? Because there is a larger goal for if their rejection means reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be? So when they turn back, when all Israel turns, when there is national salvation, what will it mean but life from the dead? Unless you're to embrace the heretical position that the resurrection is already passed, we have not yet seen that. The word mystery is used in numerous different contexts of the New Testament, including 1 Corinthians 15, the mystery of which Paul speaks, when we receive immortal bodies. That has not yet happened. Life from the dead has not yet happened. What Jesus speaks of in John 5, when the dead will come out of their graves at the voice of the Son of God, that has not yet happened. There's the spiritual coming to life, but not the physical coming to life. We have not been bodily caught up to meet the Lord in the air as he descends to set up his kingdom on the earth. This life from the dead has not yet happened. Why? Because the fullness of Israel has not come in yet. Why? Because the fullness of the Gentiles has not come in yet. So he continues, now if the first fruits offered up are as holy, uh, are holy, so is the whole batch, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. In other words, God has not forever cast off Israel. God has not abandoned Israel. If God has abandoned Israel, then God could abandon the church. If God could go back on unconditional promises he gave before the law began, remember, Paul says explicitly in Romans 3 that the law, which is 430 years after the promise, cannot annul the promise. And that promise came initially in Genesis 15 with a one-way unconditional covenant that we'll see Paul reiterates here in Romans, the 11th chapter. Now, if some of the branches were broken off and you, though a wild olive branch, were grafted in among them and have come to share in the rich root of the cultivated olive tree, do not brag that you are better than those branches. But if you do brag... You do not sustain, sustain the root. The root sustains you. Then you'll say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. True enough, they were broken off by unbelief, but you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be unafraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. So he's saying yes, and God can bring them back in. Verse 24, if you were cut off from your native wild olive tree, uh, and, and against nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own tree? There will be a Jewish turning. Now, it's clear that there is judgment for blindness. Blindness is part of the judgment. It's clear that there is judgment that follows blindness. But the salvation that comes is often well after the judgment. Look at the pattern of the Babylonian exile. There's 70 years of exile, and the restoration comes uh, uh, two generations later. And even then, it's only gradual. And then those prophets were looking for a greater restoration. The restoration that Isaiah 59 speaks of. Read it. Let everyone watching this debate go back and read Isaiah 59 and keep reading into Isaiah 60 and keep reading into Isaiah 61 and keep reading into Isaiah 62. And without possible equivocation, those things have not yet come to pass. It's impossible to say that the hardness in part is over and that the fullness of Israel has come in and that all Israel has to be saved when 98 or 99 percent of Israel to this day, of Jewish people today, still do not believe in them. The hardness in part continues. There still is a remnant saved by grace and hardness on the rest of the people. So then Paul says this, so that you will not be conceited, brothers. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. What's the mystery here? The mystery is not the unity of Jew and Gentile together. There is not a single instance anywhere in the New Testament where the Greek word pleroma, fullness, speaks of the unity of Jew and Gentile in any explicit way. That The terms are not connected there. You will not be conceited, brothers. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery. What mystery? A partial hardening has come to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, some translations do say full number, and the leading New Testament lexicon of Bauer aren't uh, uh, Danker and Gingrich says that it does mean full number here, but let's just render it as fullness. 
has the fullness of the Gentiles come in? Well, what will happen? Hati in Greek, as a result of this or on the heels of this, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the liberator will come from Zion. He'll turn away godlessness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That did not happen under any possible reading in A.D. 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. That was brutal. That was grievous. There were, according to Josephus, a million Jews killed. There was scattering. This was not a moment of liberation. This was not a moment of salvation. This was not uh, Israel, the Jewish people in Zechariah 12, something that has not yet come to pass, where all the nations come against Jerusalem and the Jewish people cry out and there is deliverance and they look to their Redeemer and there is massive repentance, leading to Zechariah 13, 1, that now a stream of repentance and cleansing opens up for the nation, leading to Zechariah 14, where the whole nation is worshiping Yahweh and the Gentiles are coming in to worship Him. That has not yet happened, along with many of the other prophetic passages, and yet Acts 3, Peter tells us Jesus must remain in heaven until all those words of the prophets come to pass. And on any fair reading, they have not yet come to pass if words do have any meaning at all. So notice, it's on the heels of, or as a result of, the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. What does it mean? It could mean full number. We know that Revelation 7 speaks of a multitude from every tongue, language, kindred. That did not happen through Paul's ministry. Paul, in a representative way, preached to different creatures, every creature under heaven, not meaning that he spoke to every human being or that this was the fullness of the harvest. When Paul died, Paul handed things over to the next generation. He knows he's about to be martyred, 2 Timothy, so he's giving counsel to Timothy to continue the mission. If the mission was completed, he wouldn't be continuing it by handing it over to him. So it could speak of the full number, a harvest from every nation, and isn't it? Wonderful, isn't it extraordinary that the gospel continues to spread, that more and more people believe in Jesus as Messiah Redeemer than any other point in world history, and that more and more Christians around the world have had the privilege of ministering in nation after nation, supernaturally have a heart for Israel. Without even being taught by other human beings, they get it from the Word. They're praying for Israel. They want to see Jewish people saved. They have a supernatural love for Israel, and they are beginning to provoke Jewish people to jealousy. And even the Israeli government recognizes that there are genuine Christian friends of Israel and there's something supernatural about it. And it is helping to undo the horrible history of anti-Semitism that was perpetrated by false followers and compromised followers in Jesus' name. Now look at what it says. Regarding the gospel, they, who is they? The Jewish people are enemies for your advantage. But regarding election, they who the nation as a whole, the people as a whole, are loved because of the patriarchs. Let's look at this again. Those upon whom hardening has come, those are the ones who will now believe. Those who are currently enemies are still the ones who are loved. He's not talking about the remnant saved by grace. He's talking about those who are opposing the gospel. Regarding the gospel, they are enemies for your advantage. But regarding election, they are loved because of the patriarchs, since God's gracious gifts and calling are irrevocable. God made unconditional promises to the nation of Israel regardless. I want to reiterate this and then come back to the fullness of the Gentiles. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 35 to 37. There are other passages like this. This is immediately after God said he would be making a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Immediately after he said that, notice he didn't say I'm making this with the Gentile world, but with Israel and Judah. It is through the mediation of Israel and Judah that this new covenant now goes to the Gentile world. Look at what it says. Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 35. This is what the Lord says, the one who gives the sun for light by day, the fixed order of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves roar. Yahweh of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from my presence, this is the Lord's declaration, then also Israel's descendants, speaking of physical descendants, will cease to be a nation before me forever. You say, well, what if they sin? This is what the Lord says. If the heavens above can be measured, and they haven't been, and the foundations of the earth fully explored, they haven't been, I will reject all of Israel's descendants because of all they have done. This is the Lord's declaration. Now, when we come back to the question of the fullness of the Gentiles, let's think of many of the prophetic passages 
about the Gentiles in the scriptures. For example, after Matthew 24, which I see having fulfillment partly in 70 AD and the rest at the return of Jesus, when I look at Matthew 24, it's followed by Matthew 25, and in verses 31 to 46 of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus speaks about the end of the age, and he speaks about the day of the judgment on the nations. And the sheep and the goats, they'll be divided as sheep and goats, and there will be judgment on the nations. Has that happened on the entire world? Obviously not, because it says some will go into eternal life and some will go into eternal punishment. Let's think of the Great Commission itself. Go and make disciples of the nations. I'm with you always to the end of the age. This is what Jesus says. Has that yet come to pass? Have the nations been discipled yet? No. If that has not yet come to pass, then the fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come to pass. If you say, well, Paul was using fullness of the Gentiles in one way in Romans 11, the Great Commission still continues. Well, then I'm not going to argue so much about Romans 11 because I'm concerned about the Great Commission and I'm concerned about the salvation of the Jewish people. So we agree that those things are still yet to happen. Acts 1.8. The gospel, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Not just the uttermost parts of the land of Israel, but the uttermost parts of the earth. That's why Paul and others went outside of the land of Israel to bring the gospel message. And, and then we go back to uh, passages, as I've mentioned, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 62. Many of those involve the Gentiles as well. Have those come to pass yet? No. Now, here's what's interesting. And I'll just touch very briefly on Luke 21 because my focus here was on Romans 11 in the plain sense of these passages here. Again, I could get into Greek verse after verse, but for the most part, it, the meaning is plain. There's no mystery here. We don't have to search for a hidden meaning because it's so plain, it's so transparent. And when you study church history, the church fathers were quite unaware that the second coming happened in the year AD 70 and that they were not looking for a coming and not looking for a Gentile harvest and, and those that had a heart for Israel not looking for Israel's salvation. But Luke 21, uh, Jerusalem trodden underfoot, until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Notice in that context as well that Jesus is speaking about judgment and scattering of Jewish people. Has that continued through the centuries? Yes. Has Jerusalem been under foreign, foreign nations and often under military strife and occupation over these centuries? Absolutely yes. And have Jewish people been scattered? Absolutely yes. Have we been regathered? Yes. Simple syllogism. When God blesses, no one can curse. When he curses, no one can bless. When he opens the door, no one can shut it. When he shuts the door, no one can open it. If he scattered the Jewish people in his anger and wrath, if, in fact, the time is over, as, as Dr. Preston has argued that God is finished with Israel on a national level, then who regathered them? If they were scattered in judgment, then either they undid the curse and they undid the word of God, which is impossible, or God himself regathered. This is telling us that God is keeping his promises and we will yet see the fullness of the Gentiles and we will yet see the salvation of the nation of Israel. God promised it. All right, thank you. Both men have gotten underway with some excellent speeches. And at this time, we are going to prepare for the rebuttals. I'm going to uh, set the clock here. So once we uh, do that, we'll be uh, ready to go. Uh, the debate today is an eschatology debate. The propositions are the Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles, as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27, was achieved in the first century. That is affirmed by Dr. Don Preston and denied by Dr. Michael Brown. And then uh, the second proposition, the Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles, as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27, is yet to be fulfilled in our future. That is affirmed by Dr. Brown and it is denied by Dr. Preston. So at this time, we're going to begin with the rebuttal speeches and uh, Dr. Preston will lead off. Are you ready? I am. Okay, you may begin. Thank you so much, and thank you, Dr. Brown, for your good presentation there. Obviously, we are on different uh, different sides of the issue here. I'm going to touch as much as possible, but obviously, as we stated at the very beginning, we're not going to be able to cover all, all the ground. I would like to be able to take a couple of different passages and just really hammer on them, really focus on them. So I'm going to do that uh, of necessity, laying some of the other issues aside. You mentioned in Romans chapter 11, 
that the Gentiles will be called in order to cause uh, Israel to, to jealousy, and you said that has not happened, but it is happening today. I would call attention to the fact that Paul emphatically denies that. Paul said in Romans chapter 11, 10 and following, that as a matter of fact, <coughs> pardon me, it was through his personal ministry that he was provoking Israel to jealousy at that very time. And by the way, I'd, I'd take notice of the fact that he cites Deuteronomy 32, 19 and following. And this is very, very critical. Why is it critical? Because Deuteronomy 32 is, a, is the Song of Moses, and it concerns Israel's last days. It is not about the end of the Christian age, not about the end of time. It is about Israel's latter end, her last time. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, uh, 21 and following. Deuteronomy 32 and 31 and following. And it was said that in that chapter, in Israel's last days, now when did Paul say Jesus came? In the last days. What last days? Didn't come in the last days of the Christian age. Did not come in the last days of, of time. He came in the last days of old covenant Israel. And it was during that last days period of time that Paul said, he, by calling the Gentiles in fulfillment of Deuteronomy 32, was in fact provoking Israel to jealousy. So it's clearly anachronistic to take the provocation of Israel to jealousy outside of the ministry of Paul. And I would like to point out, let me return to the fact that Paul said in, in Colossians chapter 1 that the Greek is in the emphatic, emphatic mode, meaning that Paul said he personally and distinctively had been given the stewardship in other words, stewardship, we could examine that because it's extremely powerful. He had been given the personal responsibility to do what? To complete the Word of God, the mystery. Now, I was somewhat surprised when my friend said there's no place in Scripture uh, that specifically links the mystery or defines the mystery as Jew and Gentile equality. Never. Well, as a matter of fact, Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul said, Unto me, who am the less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable rich, riches of God, and that I would declare to them what? The mystery of God, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and saints and partakers of the blessings of God, of Christ through the gospel. Paul specifically identifies and defines the mystery of God as Jew and, Jew and Gentile equality. I would also, also like to point out what he said. And I, You know, there, sometimes there are verses that you have a tough time memorizing. I don't know why, but Romans 16, 25 and 26 is one of them. So I'll just read it. Now, to him who, to him who is able to establish you, writing to the Romans, a Gentile church, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the, of the everlasting God, for the obedience of faith. Now, Paul had earlier said in Romans chapter 15 that it was his responsibility to go to the Gentiles and to bring them into Israel's blessings, not to create a distinctive, separate entity apart from Israel, but that the Gentiles would be grafted into Israel's root. And boy, is this important. God did not establish the church as a Gentile entity waiting for God to remove the church so that he could get back to dealing with Israel. The Gentiles were grafted into Israel's root. They were partakers of Israel's root. It is therefore simply an anomalous thing to speak of the blessings for the church versus the, the blessings for Israel. No, the only blessings for the Gentiles were to be found when they were to be grafted into Israel's root. So it's extremely important for us that we understand, that we grasp, and that we honor Paul's statement that, yes, indeed, number one, the mystery was Jew and Gentile equality in Christ. Number two, it was given to him as the personal representative, the personal steward of Christ to bring that fullness to its completion, and that Paul emphatically said that mission, that commission, that stewardship would be completed when he stood before Nero. So I, I think that we have to honor those. It gives us a temporal uh, framework within which to understand these things. And uh, Dr. Brown says we've not seen the new heaven and new earth. Well, in Isaiah chapter 65, which is a prediction of the new heaven and new earth, and boy, I'm going to have to leave so much out. <laughs> but 
In Isaiah chapter 65, Yahweh spoke to Old Covenant Israel that was being rebellious at the time. Paul quotes from Isaiah 65 twice in Romans 9 through 11. So we know where Paul applied Isaiah 65 to 66. In Isaiah chapter 65, the Lord predicted the salvation of the remnant, just like Romans chapter 9. But in, in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65, the Lord speaking to Old Covenant Israel said, You are those who forsake my holy mountain. You are those who make feasts for the idols. But he said, My servant shall eat, you shall be hungry. My servant shall drink, you shall be thirsty. My servant shall sing for joy of heart, you shall wail for sorrow of heart. For the Lord God will slay you and call his people by a new name. For behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. The new heaven and new earth, as foretold by Isaiah chapter 65 and 66, by the way, is specifically, directly, and emphatically linked to the destruction of Old Covenant Israel. Old Covenant Israel was destroyed in AD 70. There's really no controversy about that. That's when the power of the holy people was completely shattered. You see, the, the new heaven and new earth was not supposed to be a new physical heaven and earth. It was a new covenant heaven and earth, because God said right there in Isaiah 65, verse 19, the former, the former what? The former heaven and earth shall not be remembered. Well, that word remembered in the Hebrew is a covenant word. It would no longer be remembered covenantally, because God would create a new covenant heaven and earth. What is that? We call it the church, the body of Christ, that was comprised of the, of the righteous remnant of Israel into which the, the Gentiles were being grafted into the stock and the root of Israel to comprise, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, one new man. Now, my friend said, if God can, can abandon Israel, he can abandon the church. God did not abandon Israel. Israel abandoned him. God brought the covenant sanctions against Israel just like Torah demanded. And I want to reiterate my point. The times of the Gentiles could only come when Israel was in violation of Torah, Torah being valid and binding. Jesus said not one jot, not one tittle could pass from the law until it was all fulfilled. If Torah passed away in the first century, as my friend believes, then the times of the Gentiles, no matter what our concept of it, Okay, and I return to the definition of the Greek word pateo. Pateo does not mean a time of geopolitical domination. It means an active military time of war. I demonstrated from, from Revelation chapter 11, 3 and 4, that guess what? It would last three and a half years. And uh, Dr. Brown said there is judgment for blindness, that is to be sure. Well, always in those passages that I cited, Isaiah 69, uh, excuse me, Psalm 69, Isaiah uh, six, it was always imminent judgment. It wasn't protracted. And the judgment, by the way, the good doctor said, read Isaiah 59, read Isaiah 62. Well, I encourage you to do that. What you will find is that the blessings always came at the same time as the judgment. Let me jump forward to Isaiah 62, as a matter of fact, which is a promise of the restoration of Israel at the coming of the Lord. Behold, he comes, his reward is with him, and his arm shall sustain him. That's from Isaiah chapter 40. But what is the context? The coming of the Lord. Now watch this, ladies and gentlemen. In Matthew 16, 27 and 28, Jesus cited, directly echoed Isaiah 62. And he said, the Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father. That means he was going to come in judgment of every man in the same way the Father had come before. I wrote a book on that, Like Father, Like Son, on Clouds of Glory. Now watch this. The Son of Man will come in the glory of Father with his angels and shall reward every man. That's Isaiah chapter 62. As his work shall be, and verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the salvation of Israel, because it's Isaiah chapter 62. It's Isaiah chapter 59. The Lord put on his garments. He came in vengeance. But at the time of the coming of the vengeance, that was the time of the salvation as well. There is no justification for a 2,000-year gap between judgment and blessing. Well, let me skip forward very, very quickly. My friend alluded to Acts chapter 3 and said Peter was looking for the restoration, and he said it has not happened. I'd like to point something out. The Greek word for restoration there is apokatastasis. Jesus said that John was Elijah. 
Elijah was supposed to come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. The great and terrible day of the Lord would be the time of the consummation of the restoration of all things. And Jesus said, guess what? John was Elijah. John has already come. John, or Revelate, he would come and restore Apocalypse all things. John began the restoration that, pardon me, that Acts 3 foretold and that is speaking about. Are we supposed to believe that restoration has now stretched for 2,000 years and counting? No, we can't do that because here's the D. Apocatastasis is a direct synonym with the Greek word deorthosis. Deorthosis is used in Isaiah 62 for the restoration of Israel. But in Hebrews chapter 9, 6 to 10, the deorthosis would come at the end of the Mosaic law. That's why the times of the Gentiles would be fulfilled and end at the end of Torah. Let me reiterate, if the times of the Gentiles are still going on, and if Israel's salvation has not come, per Romans chapter 11, Torah remains valid. But Jesus said his coming for the salvation of Israel and fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 62 would be in the lifetime mm -hmm. of the audience that was standing there that day. It seems to me we must, we must honor all of those temporal delimitations that place the fulfillment of all prophecy, Luke 21, 22, at the time of the fulfillment or at the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Preston, and um, just a second, we are ready to go with Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown, if you are ready, you may begin. All right, hang on, just need to reset our clock here. Okay, great. Yeah, just doing it in front of you. Okay, let's go. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I had about 12 hours. <laughs> to, to, to Amen. Uh, again, I, I appreciate the passion, but boy, do I categorically disagree with that use of Scripture, and, and to me, actually, uh, an, an abuse of, of Scripture. I also have a problem with trying to make a, a precise doctrinal point using Septuagintal Greek for the Old Testament rather than looking at the Hebrew and seeing what that is saying. But let's look at a number of specifics. And again, let's, let's just start with a passage like Isaiah 62. I will not keep silent because of Zion. I will not keep still because of Jerusalem until her righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. That does not happen when the city of Jerusalem is destroyed and judgment comes on a people. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God. You will no longer be called deserted and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you'll be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you and your land will be married. Jerusalem I've appointed watchmen on your walls. They'll never be silent day or night. There's no rest for you who remind the Lord. Do not give him rest until he establishes and makes Jerusalem the praise of the earth with promise after promise. And, and Israel's blessing and Jerusalem's blessing then means blessing to the entire world. Under no possible circumstances can you say that Zechariah 12 has been fulfilled where God miraculously delivers Jerusalem as it is surrounded by nations delivers them by his power and his Jewish people on a national level repent and mourn and grieve and recognize the Messiah. That has not yet happened. And what does Peter say in Acts the third chapter? That the Messiah must remain in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things spoken by the prophets. If we had several hours I could read passage after passage after passage from the prophets that under no fair meaning of the words and terms has come to pass. Since the book of Revelation reiterates the promise of the new heaven and the new earth, Dr. Preston says we're already there. We're already in the time of the new heaven and the new earth. Well, John is still looking forward to this to happen. We could debate the dating of Revelation. Most scholars, of course, put it well after AD 70. But let's leave that out for right now. Has this happened? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Has that happened? Obviously not, and the sea no longer existed. I also saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for a husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne, Look, 
God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Has that happened? No. Death will no longer exist. Has that happened? No. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer. Has that happened? No. Because the previous things have passed away. Of course we're still waiting for these things to take place. They have not yet taken place. And please do read Isaiah 59. God brings judgment. It's normally he brings judgment on the nations, and that brings the salvation of his people, and or he brings judgment on the sinners of his people, which then brings salvation to the rest of the nation. I, I find it, um, and I know Dr. Preston is very serious, he's written all his books on this subject, heads up an institute uh, on this very uh, subject, but I, I find it irresponsible use of scripture to say Psalm 69 speaks about judgment and, and because it speaks about blindness and judgment, that therefore that's Paul's whole message there in, in, um, in Romans 9 through 11. No, Psalm 69 is not even a datable psalm. It's either written by David or of the Davidic collection. And it's not saying that here's where we come up with some type of divine chronology of how he works. It's simply illustrating the fact that there is blindness on Israel. It's happened in history. It's happened again. I'm not a dispensationalist. I don't believe there's any 2,000-year gap of any kind. My people, Israel, we have been under judgment, but we have been preserved just as God promised. He said we'd be scattered to the nations, and we'd be disciplined, and yet we'd be preserved. Has that happened? Yes. He said he'd bring us back to the land in unbelief, Ezekiel 36. Has that happened? Yes. And is he working salvation in the land? Are more and more Israelis coming to faith in Jesus than, than before in the modern history of Israel? Overwhelmingly so, yes. So we see God at work. The idea that there's no controversy about the end of God's covenantal relationship with Israel in AD 70, I object to that in the strongest possible terms based on Scripture and based on the fact that God himself has preserved us in the midst of our scattering. By the way, uh, I did not say that the word mystery is not used in terms of Jew and Gentile unity. That's certainly part of the mystery that Paul speaks of. I said the word fullness, pleroma, is never used explicitly for Jew and Gentile unity. And that was the point that I was uh, referring to in my presentation, which was obviously differing even there with Dr. Preston's. If I didn't say that, uh, then that was a complete misstatement. If, if I said mystery instead of fullness, but I believe I said it accurately, that the word fullness is never used explicitly for Jew and Gentile unity. And Paul spells out in Romans the 11th chapter what the mystery is. That partial hardness, not complete hardness, partial hardness has come on Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So well, here's what we have to, here's, here's the, to me, the spiritual double talk, no insult intended, that we have to believe. That when Paul talks about all Israel being saved, he's talking about the multitude of Israel being judged. That when Paul talks about something positive and glorious, he's actually talking about the slaughtering of a million Jews. That all of the glorious promises that God is giving actually are talking about terrible destruction and judgment. That's unconscionable, and it's contrary to the, to the many, many promises to Israel that exist in the Old Testament and that are reiterated by Jesus in the New. For example, in Matthew, the 19th chapter, where he says at the time of the renewal of the world that the 12 disciples will rule over the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 tribes of Israel is never used as a term for Gentiles. You, you won't find it. The church is not the new Jacob. The church is not the new Israel. Saved Jews and saved Gentiles make up this wonderful ecclesia, this messianic family, and together we are one in Jesus. There's no higher, no, no lower. There's no caste system or class system. We are equal. Romans 10, the same Lord is Lord of all richly, blessing all who call on him, Jew and Gentile alike. And yet there are promises that remain of a harvest of the nations that has not yet reached its fullness. And there are promises that remain of all Israel being saved that has obviously not yet happened. And the turning away from sins, that didn't happen in, in AD 70. Again, just read the plain language of Romans 11, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. That under no reading of the text could have happened. In AD 70, it was not the time of the forgiveness of their sins. It was not the time of salvation. We're told it's the time of the breaking of the covenant instead. Now, when we when we look at the, the issue of the promises of God, uh, first, I, I, I never said that I don't 
observe Sabbath, I don't observe it in a legalistic binding way, but I believe that Jesus brings the fullness of the Sabbath to us, that we receive rest in him. Colossians, the second chapter, he is the substance, the day itself is the shadow, and also the new covenant does not destroy or obliterate the old. That would mean that Jesus, when he said, I didn't come uh, to abolish but to fulfill, what he really meant was abolish. The language that, that my good doctor, Dr. Preston, is using, the language that he's using is language of abolishing. Jesus said he didn't come to abolish but to fulfill, to bring it to its fullest meaning. Let's look at Israel's calendar, all right? The Messiah is crucified, one, in conjunction with Passover. He rises with the first fruit celebration, and he sends the Spirit at Shavuot, Pentecost. Those were the spring feasts of Israel. Now we go to the fall feast. He returns in the clouds of heaven for the entire world to see him, like lightning from the east to the west, he comes, what, with the sound of the shofar, the sound of the trumpet. That has not yet happened. The dead being raised has not yet happened. Again, unless Dr. Preston embraces the position that Paul says is heretical, saying that the resurrection is already past, that it refers to something spiritual. And there's no way that you could say that A.D. 70 brings about the resurrection of the dead, that we all rise from our graves and are with the Lord never to die again, and that, that this is an immortal body. If there's an immortal body, someone has not yet informed the human race and believers that we don't have to physically die because we've been dying for 2,000 years. Why? Because the resurrection has not yet happened. The appearing that Paul longed for has not yet happened. The appearing he longed for was not a destruction of Jerusalem. The appearing he longed for was the final redemption and the resurrection of the righteous of which Paul spoke quite explicitly. And, and not only spoke explicitly in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 chapter, 1 Thessalonians 4 says he's coming with, what, the sound of the trumpet. 1 Corinthians 15, the last trumpet, Revelation 7, the seventh of seven trumpets. The 11th chapter of Revelation states the same thing. This is the return of the Messiah in conjunction with what? The fall feast of Israel, which is then followed by atonement, national atonement for Israel, as we see in Zechariah 13, followed by Sukkot tabernacles, which is what? The ingathering of the Gentiles. And what does Zechariah 14 tell us? That they will come and worship Yahweh in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. So what am I saying? That Messiah fulfilling the law, he yet brings to pass the fulfillment of Israel's calendar. These things are yet to come and unfold in front of us, again, by any plain meaning of the text. Does the Great Commission continue after Paul's death? Of course it does. Does he want Timothy, does he want Titus to raise up elders to continue the mission? Of course. Does Acts 28 end in such a way that indicates there is more to the story? Quite intentionally. It is ending and telling you there is more, and now this is going to be written in ongoing church history. Does Revelation 7, the harvest of a multitude from every, trung, every tongue and tribe, does, has that already happened? Did Paul actually think that the gospel had gone to the entire inhabited world, that everyone had heard it, and that the fullness of the harvest had come in? What are we then doing? And why did Paul give instructions then for the next generations after him? No, the Great Commission remains. We continue to make disciples of the nations. Jesus is with us, what, till the end of the age. So we continue to go with his authority, reaping the harvest, provoking Israel to jealousy, not just the jealousy of judgment, of which Paul spoke in Romans 10, but the jealousy of emulation of which he spoke in Romans the 11th chapter, where the Jewish people now want to follow what the Gentiles have. I encourage every Gentile believer, continue to provoke Israel to envy, continue to come into your fullness so that all Israel may be saved, and we will see the glorious culmination of this age as King Jesus returns to rule and to reign. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown. Okay, that brings us to the second, uh, or rather the third segment of this debate. And ladies and gentlemen who have tuned in, this is a debate on eschatology uh, with Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. Don Preston. Uh, the propositions are the Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27 was achieved in the first century. That was affirmed by Dr. Preston and denied by Dr. Brown. And then uh, Dr. Brown affirms that the Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27 is yet to be fulfilled in our future. 
and that was uh, denied by Dr. Preston. So at this time, we're at the section where we're going to do the 15-minute cross-examinations, as we said before. Uh, as we are uh, doing the, as you gentlemen are doing the cross-examinations, these will consist of asking questions and not stating of positions, and uh, so as to respond to answers from previous uh, or last questions. Uh, be very much focused on asking of questions, and then any commentary which is outside of that groundwork um, is briefly considered out of, of, of bounds, or any um, questions outside of that would be out of bounds. So we're asking for uh, your participation. You agreed to the rules at the top of the um, discussion, and so now is the real time to challenge us because I know how <laughs> exciting these things can get at this point. So we do ask you to maintain that, uh, that restraint and self-control in this section. Our, give me uh, just a moment to get my time set, and then we will be underway in uh, just a few seconds. Okay, Dr. Preston, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, and, uh, here we go. <clears throat> Dr. Brown, thank you so very much for that last presentation. And I agree 100%. I wish we had 12 hours. <laughs> minimum, absolute minimum. That's why I said at the beginning of the program, perhaps we can have other discussions so that we can really focus on some of these particular scriptures. We can do some genuine exegetical work and just instead of throwing out there and saying, well, I could, I could read 100 verses. Well, I could read 100 verses also. But you and I both would agree that we need to do exegetical work in order to answer the real questions. That's where answers are to be found, not simply by citing, not simply by saying, well, this agrees with me. Okay, here are be the beginning of some of my questions to you, Dr. Brown. I know I will not get to all of my questions. Uh, you alluded to and you cited Isaiah chapter 62, which was a prediction, we both agree, on the restoration of Israel. The nations will see, uh, the nations will come to your glory, the land would be married. This is a prediction of the remarriage between Yahweh and the ten northern tribes. And according to my understanding, my question will be here momentarily. Number one, Paul said that he had espoused the church at Corinth to Christ as a chaste virgin. Paul preached nothing but the hope of Israel. He preached the remarriage. Revelation chapter 19 posits the wedding at the time of the destruction of Babylon which, of course, I take as Old Covenant Jerusalem. It's the city where the Lord was slain. So, yes, we could argue about the debating and what have you, but I would pose this question. If, in fact, Babylon was Old Covenant Jerusalem, and Revelation 19.6 posits the wedding at the time of that destruction, would that not demonstrate that the salvation of Israel, of Isaiah 62, would likewise. You have both salvation and judgment, therefore, but the judgment is a remarriage. So if Babylon of Revelation was Old Covenant Jerusalem, would that not indicate that Isaiah was 62 would have been fulfilled in AD 70? Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to that in a moment. I, 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 I do think that's a bit of a stating of a position. Uh, and not just asking a question, just just going forward. Okay. Well, I apologize. I don't. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to lay the groundwork. No, no, I I understand that. Uh, but I don't accept any of the premises there. Okay. Uh, first, I I don't accept in the text of Isaiah 62 that this is speaking of the regathering of the ten northern tribes. Uh, that can always be implicit in terms of final restoration. But if we read the text, uh, it, it says none of that there. The focus is on Zion and Jerusalem. Nations will see your righteousness, namely what righteousness of Zion and Jerusalem, all kings, your glory. That did not happen in Isaiah 6, in, in um, AD 70. In point of fact, we see throughout the prophets that when God judged Jerusalem, that was a shameful time, and it actually brought reproach to Yahweh's name. The reason that he regathered the Jewish people in Ezekiel 36, he said, it's not because of your righteousness, but because my name is being profaned. He says in Isaiah 52, my name is being blasphemed among the nations because you're scattered. So the glory comes when Israel, physical Israel, the Jewish people, are miraculously regathered. The glory comes when God's presence so fills the city that the nations come. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the palm of your God. That's not a description of judgment of a million people killed and tens of thousands crucified and a city and temple destroyed. Quite the contrary. That's when there's reproach. That's when the nations hiss and say, what happened to Israel? What happened to Israel's God? When God acts salvifically, when God miraculously restores, when God raises up multitudes of people to follow him. Let's look at what the promises said. Again, 
when I say I could give verse after verse, and I'll exegete verse after verse to say categorically these speak of things that have not yet come to pass. So I, I don't accept any of the premises of in terms of the application. Also, the book of Revelation with its spiritual imagery uh, is so rich in imagery that we need to establish doctrine first and then come to Revelation and see how these things are being spiritually applied. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification, and I certainly did not miss, uh, uh, intend to misrepresent you, or, and I didn't say, did not intend to state position. So let me go back and ask another question on Isaiah 62. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, first of all, that it predicted the marriage of Yahweh with Israel? Yes. Okay. Do you agree that Jesus is echoing and citing Isaiah 62 and Matthew 16, 27, 28? Uh, that's not his his primary emphasis there, because there are many many other things. In in other words, there can be a passage that's quoted. Sometimes the New Testament author is looking at the whole chapter. Sometimes the New Testament author is looking at one verse within the chapter. Sometimes the New Testament author is looking at, at one word or one theme that then occurs in other places. So we have to look at that carefully, uh, okay. and, and see. Sometimes the verse is just we we know we do the same when we're preaching. We may just grab one verse and use it. We may use one verse because of a larger context. So no, I do not believe that he was primarily pointing to the Isaiah 62 restoration. Uh, and, and certainly as a Jewish person, part of the prayers that he taught his disciples to pray were prayers for the kingdom of God to come and God's will to be done on earth. And that was in keeping with the prayers of first century Jews. The Jews continue to pray for those things because they have not yet happened in full. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I made a point a few moments ago concerning uh, apocatastasis, restoration of all things, being a synonym with uh, deorthosis in Hebrews chapter 9. Number one, do you accept that those are synonyms? They can be used synonymously. I wouldn't say that they're straight synonyms, but I, I honestly, um, I'd have to look more carefully to see how uh, precisely I would define the differences between them. But let's just say, for argument's sake, that I'll accept them being used synonymously. If you've studied it more than I have at this point, let's just say I accept that premise. I'm not sure, but let's just say I accept it for argument's sake. Go ahead. My point was that, uh, and I don't want to state a position though. <laughs> I'm not supposed to state a position here. But since you've asked, uh, my position yeah. is that apocatastasis and deorthosis are synonyms. All of the lexicons give that. Deorthosis being a synonym, but deorthosis would occur at the end of Torah, at the end of the Law of Moses. Therefore, the apocatastasis would occur at the time, at the end of Torah. Yeah, here, here's where I would differ with you. And okay. my whole focus in my Ph.D. work was, was uh, philology and, and looking at etymology, looking at the meaning of words and how they're used. My dissertation was on the Hebrew root rafa, how it's used in, in, in the Old Testament and the ancient Near East. I've written a bunch of articles on, on, for theological dictionaries just on it. So I love to do what you're doing, which is look at individual words. I've done it more in the Hebrew and see how they're used. But let's understand, uh, a word can be used in, in 10 different contexts in 10 different ways with 10 different applications. So the word restoration in one place uh, could be, look, I could be talking about the restoration of a car in one place and the restoration of a marriage in another place and the restoration of the world in another place. It's the same word, all used in different contexts. So let's look specifically at what Peter said. What God predicted through the mouth of all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So he's not saying judgment and destruction of Jerusalem. He's saying repentance will bring seasons of refreshing, refreshing that he may send Jesus, not, not in destruction, but in refreshing, who has been appointed for you as the Messiah. Heaven must welcome him until the times of the restorations of all things, now he's going to define it, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. So a passage like Isaiah 11, uh, the wolf lying with the lamb, again, we can take it metaphorically to speak of nation with nation. We can take it literally to speak of the animal kingdom. But either way, there's going to be no more war. There's going to be no more suffering. There's going to be universal acknowledgement of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord in the entire earth. That hasn't happened. So the time of the restoration of the prophets, uh, the swords have not yet been beaten into plowshares. Isaiah 2 and other passages have not yet come to pass. So we're still awaiting that as defined by Peter. Okay. Uh, you suggested that when I 
took note of the fact that Paul cited, quoted verbatim from Psalm 69, and Paul applied that to the blindness of Israel of his day, that it was irresponsible, that was the word you used, and of course you were very kind and very gracious, saying you weren't trying to be, <laughs> be harsh for me, uh, and I appreciate that, uh, you've been a perfect gentleman, but uh, is it irresponsible for me to point out that Paul did in fact use that blindness motif from Psalms, and as the Raz Peshar, uh, I probably did not pronounce that correctly, by the way, <laughs> I had a difficult time with that, but the New Testament writers tell us emphatically, 1 Peter chapter 1, that they are interpreting the Old Testament prophecies. We discussed in our, this in our first debate. So was Paul properly applying the blindness of Israel and the context of Psalms 69 when he introduced the blindness of Israel, saying, let their table become a snare to them, which would indicate it seems judgment. So have I completely and totally missed the point? of Paul's application of Psalm 69, or, or was Paul properly applying the motif of judgment in regard to the blindness? Yes, and thanks for, for asking for that clarification, and, and thanks for taking my, my words graciously. Uh, we've both been direct, but, but with respect, so I, I do appreciate the ability to do that. First, let's recognize, for example, in Romans 3, that when Paul talks about universal sinfulness, he takes a number of verses from the Psalms, which are, are, are strung together to speak of the sinfulness of human beings as opposed to strung together to say, look at each psalm and the context of each psalm, and I'm getting across the larger message of that. It's actually not what he's doing. Rather, he's saying this is how sinful human beings are, and, and it's, it's a list of verses, a catena of verses that he, he takes to illustrate that. In Psalm 69, I have no issue with the usage saying that the, the, the blindness is a divine judgment. I agree with that. But to now take some chronological statement, maybe I misunderstood you, but I thought you were drawing some type of chronology to say that blindness is followed by judgment as indicated by Psalm 69, where Psalm 69 is simply speaking of the blindness is part of God's judgment, and Paul is saying in Romans 11 that Israel is under judgment, and Israel has still been under judgment, and until Israel turns, Israel's receiving mercy in the midst of judgment because God is still acting for his name's sake, so his name won't be blasphemy among the nations, and he's brought his Jewish people back. He's kept us, he's regathered us, and brought us back to the land. And in the land, he's sprinkling clean water on us, and mercy's coming little by little to more and more and more people. But we're still under judgment, and that the hardness still remains, and that will be until the end when there'll be a national turning. So... Uh, I hope that clarifies my understanding of the use of Psalm 69 and where I took issue with the way I, I understood you were using it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Dr. Brown, do you believe that the law of Moses, with every single one, with every jot and every tittle, is still binding, binding and enforcing and mandatory today? No. Okay. How then would you respond, because I didn't hear any kind of response earlier, how then would you respond to the argument that I made that the times of the Gentiles is a direct result of violation of Torah, therefore if Torah is, has been fulfilled and is no longer binding, that therefore the times of the Gentiles must have ended? I would like to hear your response. Yeah, I appreciate that, and in my question time for you, I, I, I want to explore that a little further. Uh, I, I didn't feel that the point was made in any categorical way. The fact that there was a particular judgment that God brought uh, uh, under the law of Moses does not believe does not mean that he could not bring that judgment outside of the law of Moses. The fact that, for example, he might smite Israel with certain judgments under the law doesn't mean that he will not smite Israel or another nation with judgments outside of the law. So I, I didn't find that to be conclusively demonstrated, and I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to do that uh, in the Q&A part. So uh, for me, uh, I know you put a lot of stress on that, uh, but I didn't find the, the stress to be convincing. And again, God is sovereign. Uh, where does it tell us? And, and, and in fact, this specific phrase, the times of the Gentiles, I'm not aware, and, and when, I, when I come back to question you, you can tell me where that specific phrase is explicitly tied in with something in the five books of Moses and covenant blessings and curses that can only be applied there and can't be applied outside of it. So that's what I didn't find conclusive 
and, and therefore I didn't respond to it directly in the, the time frame that I had. Okay, how much time do we have, William? A uh, little, uh, little over a minute. Sorry, oh, okay. a little over a minute. I'm sorry, Don. Oh, okay. I'm that, well, off to keep from interrupting you. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Brown, you, you brought up the last three feast days, which is one of my very favorite topics in all of the world. I must say to you, I absolutely love it. Thank you for introducing that. In Revelation chapter 11, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet, that is, that's done in direct conjunction, as I read the text, of the judgment destruction of the city, quote, where the Lord was slain. Could you please explain to us how we can delineate temporally between the judgment of that city where the Lord was slain and the sounding of the seventh trumpet? Yeah, of course, if, if uh, we date Revelation before or after 70, we could say John was either looking back or John was looking ahead. But I do believe that there will be a final uh, destruction and a final deliverance. That, that what happened in 70 on a certain level will be recapitulated at the end of the age and that that will finally unfold with the salvation of Israel. Okay, thank you. It's time. All right. Thank you uh, both for uh, the first part of that cross-examination. So at this time, it is Dr. Brown's time to ask his questions. Dr. Brown, are you ready? I'm ready. Thank you. Okay. And thank you, sir, for doing such a good job of, of rehearsing the rules for us and, and being such a forceful and fair moderator. All okay. right, uh, uh, Dr. Preston, uh, this is cross-examination, but some of it is clarification uh, just because I, I don't know all of your views on all of these subjects. So uh, some of it is cross-examination, some of it is, is clarification. Uh, could you explain to me your understanding of Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations and Revelation the seventh chapter that there'll be a multitude uh, from every tribe, tongue, language, etc. Uh, how do you see that in terms of history and in terms of application for believers today? Excellent question and I appreciate that very much. I believe that in Matthew chapter 28 it's directly par parallel with Mark 16, 15, and, uh, 15 through 20. That Jesus was, when he said, I, I will be with you, I believe that was a promise of the miraculous, uh, the miraculous, the charismata, if you please, until the end of the age. I find it directly parallel to Matthew, or to the Olivet Discourse. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom Will be, will be preached in all the world as a witness to the nations, then comes the end. Now, <clears throat> pardon me, there's a fourfold pattern in the Olivet Discourse. I will alliterate it. Preaching, persecution, power, parousia. He told them to go to preach. He said when they would go and preach, they would be persecuted. They should bring you before kings, before governors, before Sanhedrins. But he promised them power. And he said, give no thought to what you shall say in, at that time, for it shall be given to you by the Holy Spirit what you shall say in that hour. That's miraculous divine inspiration. I believe that was Jesus being, quote, with the apostles. I believe that the end of the age of Matthew 28, 18 to 20 is the identical end of the age of Matthew 24, verse 3, that the di disciples link directly with Jesus' prediction of the fall of Jerusalem, which in turn is directed or directly taken from Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. The time of the end in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, is directly and specifically identified in verse 7 as the time when the power of the holy people would be completely shattered. Now, the natural question that I can already see your gears turning is, okay, if the Great Commission was until the end of that age, then where do we come in about preaching? Paul was very clear in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. The book of Revelation is very clear that even after the end of the age, it would be the purpose and the, and the glory and the power of the church to continue to make known to all men what is the riches, the wisdom of his grace, Ephesians chapter 2. Now that's after the end of the age, just like Revelation chapter 21, after the end of the millennium, after the great white throne judgment, the nations are still outside the city, but they're invited to come into the city where the river of life flows, where the tree of life is, is found for the healing of the, of the nation. There's evangelism after the time of the end of the age. So, first of all, I see Jesus has promised to be with them in a miraculous sense until the end of the age. The end of the age was in AD 70 with the dissolution of the Old Covenant uh, system, the passing of the Law of Moses, 
but the ongoing, the everlasting necessity to reach out to the nations to bring them into the salvation which God has wrought through covenant Israel. All right, thank you. Does it, it strike you as odd that perhaps you go to a baseball game and 30 seconds into the baseball game, they say, okay, the game is over. Now we're just going to play the next nine innings. In other words, <laughs> since you objected to the 2,000-year gap idea, uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying everything was done 2,000 years ago, and now it's just kind of the aftermath. Uh, I'm just wondering if that strikes you as strange in terms of, of God's plan and how it affects world history. I'm not quite sure that I understand everything that you're asking there, but let me explain it like this. When we look at eschatology, we have to understand that it posits both a cataclysmic end but a glorious beginning. Far too many people look upon the fall of Jerusalem and they say, oh, you're focusing on judgment. You're focusing on judgment and condemnation and two-thirds of the Jews perishing. No, no, no. What I'm focusing on is the fact that not only was it the end, as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, the end of all things has drawn near, but that cataclysmic end would give rise to the wor everlasting world of righteousness, the new covenant age of Jesus Christ, which will never end. That's the glorious world that we live in today. And so I don't, I don't think about in terms of going to a baseball game and saying three innings in, saying it's over. I look at the fact that God used old covenant Israel for his divine purposes. They were extremely blessed. They were never intended to be the eternal determinative purpose of God. They were supposed to be fulfilled in the body of Christ. The old covenant mortal body of Israel was supposed to give way to the immortal body of Jesus Christ and his, his church, the body. Okay, so as we come to resurrection then, what Paul describes as uh, us being receiving a spiritual body and being clothed with incorruptibility. Uh, has the resurrection already taken place? Do you already have your immortal body? I believe we have to understand Paul's discussion of resurrection within the context of a corporate body resurrection. And by the way, <coughs> pardon me, I'm certainly not alone in this as a preterist. There are many scholars who are now recognizing on an increasing level the corporate nature of Paul's discussion of resurrection. Tom Holland uh, among others, N.T. Wright, among others. They're seeing, they're certainly not preterists, but they're seeing that when Paul talks about resurrection, uh, he is talking about a corporate discussion, not the biological body per se, but rather he's talking about Old Covenant Israel dying to the Old Covenant uh, fashion or world, the ministration of death written and graven in stones, being raised as the incorruptible body of Christ. And by the way, that's not bad news. That was their goal. That was their glory. It, it was their hope. And so it's, it's not bad news at all. So when Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says when we, collective, corporate, put off the corruptible, put on the incorruptibility. And I would also point this out. Paul specifically posits that at the time of the passing of the Old Covenant. Because he says, when this mortal shall have put on immortality, when the corruptible shall have put on incorruptibility, then shall be brought to pass the saying. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 25, quotes Hosea chapter 13. And it, then he poses the question, this rhetorical, great rhetorical question, and, and he quotes, or he says, O oh, sin, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? The sting of death is the law. Now, my reading of the New Testament, my reading of Scripture says, only Torah was the strength of sin. The gospel certainly is not the strength of sin, but the resurrection would be when the law that was the strength of the sin would be overcome. Well, if... You know, Paul uses the term the law 117 times in the New Testament. Only 10 times does he not refer to Torah. And in every one of those remaining parts, uh, passages, when he's not referring to Torah, he is referring to, for instance, to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans chapter 8, or the law of sin and death, again, Romans chapter 8. So Paul's reference to, quote, the law, anytime he uses the term the law, 
it's invariably Torah. So whatever we might think of resurrection, Paul unequivocally posits at the time of the overcoming, the passing away of the law that was the strength of sin. Romans chapter 7, Paul says, I had not known sin, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Pretty clear what law he has in mind there. And he's speaking of, of not only himself individually, but Israel corporately under Torah. So we have to look at these things, these concepts of resurrection. In the first place, Paul said resurrection was the hope of Israel. And I would certainly agree with W.D. Davies when he comments on Romans chapter 11 with Tom Holland in his book on uh, Contours of Pauline Theology. When he co comments on Romans chapter 11, he is talking about the conversion of Israel, and he sees that, <clears throat> pardon me, as N.T. Wright does as well, not of a raising of biological bodies out of the grave, but as Israel being raised out of sin death. And I agree with that. Now, I, they certainly disagree with me on my full eschatology, but they're seeing the corporate nature of it. They're seeing that it is Israel, it is Israel being brought out from under sin death. All right, so if we look at 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul applies this in a very personal level, saying don't grieve over the ones who've physically died, right? Be because yes. because uh, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who've fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. He's not speaking about uh, Israel there, but about the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so will we always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. If this is not speaking of a literal, physical resurrection to be expected, which I would also press in 1 Corinthians 15, I see no way that this personal application can be made, encourage one another with these words. So what do you think I'm missing there in my understanding of 1 Thessalonians 4? Great question. This is one of those that takes 12 hours. Uh, and I developed this extensively, by the way, in my book, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings. But let me hit just a few very, very quick things. Point number one, Paul said this, we say to you by the word of the Lord. The only place in all of Jesus' personal ministry teaching that Paul is drawing from, as virtually all scholars agree, when Paul says, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, he's drawing from some well-known discourse of Jesus. The only place in all of Jesus' ministry in which we have every constituent element that Paul lists in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is Matthew 24, 29 to 34. We have the coming of the Son of Man, we have the coming on the clouds, the coming with the angels, the sound, the shout, and the sound of a trumpet. And Jesus said in verse 34, this generation shall not pass until all of these things are fulfilled. Well, Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 talks about the coming of the Lord, the parousia, which is what the disciples asked about in Matthew 24. He has Jesus coming on the clouds. We have him coming with the angels. We have him coming with, with the trumpet. That is the consummation of Israel's festivals. I agree 100%. Notice that Paul twice uses the present active indicative to say, we who are, not those who will be, we who are alive and remain until the parousia will not prevent or will not go before those who are alive in Christ. Paul is affirming that the dead, the dead who had died physically, I agree with that 100%. Paul is agreeing that they would receive their eternal reward. I agree that it's those of Hebrews chapter 11. But Paul, is not, Paul doesn't say one single word about biological bodies coming out of the grave. He talks about their, them receiving their reward. And I would point this out, and this is extremely critical. Paul says we shall meet him in the air. We generally look upon Paul's discourse there and say, oh, well, that's, that's Jesus coming to take the Christians off the earth. No, it's not correct. As N.T. Wright and a host of other scholars have rightly recognized, and in my book that I just prefaced or mentioned, We Shall Meet Him in the Air, The Wedding of the King of Kings, I have about as long of a linguistic study in that book as you'll find on the Greek word apontesis, translated meet him. Apontesis was a technical word in the first century when it was used with parousia, a technical word, apontesis, in the context of a royal a visit by a dignitary, it meant that this royal dignitary was coming to visit a, a given city. The inhabitants of the city would see him coming. They would go out to meet him. 
then they would escort him back to the city. The city was his destination. And I appreciate you shaking your head. Yes. But, okay, that's fantastic. What this means for us is that in the lifetime of the generation to whom Paul is writing, those of us who are alive and remain until the parousia, just like he said in 1 Corinthians 15, brethren, we will not all sleep. We will not all die, that is, before the resurrection, before this change that he was talking about. So whatever it was Paul talking about, he was positing it in his generation. Just as Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 5, Christ, said Christ was ready, Greek word hitoimos, which means not only morally ready, but temporally on the point of doing something. The end of all things is drawn near, verse 7. And then he says something quite amazing. The time has come for the judgment. What judgment? He uses the onophoric article, and you know what that means. The onophoric article refers back to a subject that's been introduced. What's the subject that's been introduced? The, the judgment of the living and the dead. The dead at Christ's judgment were going to be brought out of Hades, and the righteous were going to enter into the most holy place. Well, Revelation 15 says that would take place at the fall of, Je uh, of Babylon. Whoever that city is or was, that's when man could enter into the most holy place, into the presence of God. That's when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the great worthies of Hebrews chapter 11, that's when they would inherit the great heavenly Jerusalem, the better city and the better country which God had prepared. And so the writer says, even at that time, they were right then standing. You have come to Mount Zion. Zion is the locus of resurrection. Yeah, and by the way, yeah. oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, my point being that we have a perfect correlation of theme. We have a perfect correlation of time statements in Thessalonians and Corinthians in all of these passages about how the, or where the New Testament writers say this was going to be fulfilled, and they claim to be, by the way, the final determinative interpreters of the Old Covenant prophecies. Is that the end of the Q&A? Oh, well, we had just a few seconds left. Yeah, we only, I'm sorry, Dr. Proud. I, <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, you all have uh, done well during that session, and I really appreciate it. I'm sure the audience appreciates, appreciates it as well. can't get these words out now. I've been sitting here so intensely listening to uh, the discussion between the two. And uh, now we're down to the um, final uh, speeches, which are five minutes. And uh, this is where uh, each of you will make your five-minute closing statements. So let me uh, get the uh, uh, clock set here. And for those of you who have tuned into the debate, this has been a debate about the fullness of times. The Bible teaches that the fullness of the Gentiles, as foretold in Romans 11, 25 through 27, was achieved in the first century. And um, so at this time, uh, Brother Preston, are you ready? I am, I am ready. Okay, <clears throat> you have five minutes. You may begin. Thank you. Uh Dr. Brown, let me reiterate my very, very sincere and very deeply felt appreciation for for you and your super cordiality, your respect, a true, being a true gentleman. Uh, that means so much. I've debated some men, and I'm sure you have, <laughs> that did not conduct themselves in the way that they should. This kind of debate can only do good. It, it causes people to study and to think. And that's what our purpose really ought to be. So in my closing here, I'd like to go back to some of the points, just reiterate the points that I made. I'm certainly not going to introduce any new points, which would be inappropriate. When Paul talks about the blindness, and let me make a clarifying point even, uh, even more uh, that Dr. Brown asked for. My point in, in pointing out that Paul in Romans chapter 11 alluded three times to the blindness of Israel was to say that uh, he, when he's drawing from Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm 69, that Psalm 69, just like Isaiah 13, indicated that judgment was imminent. Whether that judgment was in Isaiah's day, whether it was in the psalmist's day. The point of fact is, the Jews of Jesus' day, the Jews of Paul's day, would have understood that by citing Isaiah 6 and Psalm 69, they would have known that judgment was right around the corner. And thus, when Paul in Acts 28 closes out his personal ministry by warning the Jews, by citing Isaiah chapter 6, they knew that judgment was coming. And 
what I also pointed out, and perhaps I did not point this out sufficiently, but I do want to emphasize this. We cannot focus strictly on judgment, and I apologize if anyone's heard me focusing strictly on judgment, because what I try to preach very, very much is that the end of old covenant Israel's covenant age, as I pointed out in Isaiah chapter 65, the end of old covenant Israel would be the full bloom and the full glory of the new covenant world of Jesus Christ, the new covenant, heaven and earth. And so when Paul in Romans 11 cites Isaiah 27 and says that Israel's salvation would come when, not afterward, but when the altar would be turned to chalk stone, when Isaiah 59 says Israel's judgment would, be, would come when the Lord came in judgment of Israel shedding uh, on Israel for shedding innocent blood, I believe that we have to take those very seriously. And once again, the power of this is to see that this is the consummation of Israel's history. God promised he was going to replace the old covenant with a new covenant. He said he was going to replace the old people with a new people with a new name. So I'm you know, I mean, Isaiah chapter 65. And we can discuss that. We can replace, replace, talk about replacement theology in another program, as you and Gary did recently. But it's not replacement as in failure. I drove the point home. I emphasized the point that in Romans chapter 11, the Gentiles were, be, were being grafted into Israel's root. They were not a separate entity. They were not a new entity. They were partaking of Israel's spiritual blessings as had always been foretold. That's why Paul could say in Romans chapter 15, it's not a strange thing for the Gentiles to partake of Israel's spiritual things. And so here we have Paul in Romans chapter 11. He is promising two things. By, by drawing on Psalm 69, having Isaiah chapter 6 echoed in the background by referencing the blindness of Israel. He is saying that Israel's old covenant world was about to pass away. Was that traumatic? Was that bad? Oh, yes, it was horrible. But it was also good news in that Israel's blessings to come at the end of Israel's old covenant world and the passing of the ministration of death would result in the new covenant of Jesus Christ, the covenant of everlasting life in which we now can have righteousness, we can have eternal life. We're not under Torah, it passed away. And when Torah passed away, as I pointed out repeatedly, the times of the Gentiles ended. The, the times of the Gentiles had to do with an active military war, not a 2,000 year period of geopolitical domination. That period of time was defined in Revelation as lasting three and a half years, which is precisely what happened in the siege of Jerusalem ending in AD 70. We are now living in the everlasting kingdom of Jesus Christ. To turn this on. I try not to interrupt you guys <laughs> with noise. Okay, well, Dr. Brown, um, we are ready for your um, final speech, and uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, again for moderating. And uh, Dr. Preston, yes, you've been as gracious as, as possible in the midst of, of a serious debate. I appreciate it. Uh, I've written 27 books. None of them have focused on the issue of eschatology. You've written, what, like 27 books. Every one of them has focused on eschatology. <laughs> so I know you've done your homework, but I have focused on Israel much. Of course, we are enjoying the blessings of the new covenant in Jesus. Of course, he is the preeminent one. Of course, we have entered into this glorious time of forgiveness of sins through the cross and eternal life the moment we are born again. Of course, we are in this world, but we are not of it. Of course, we're in the transition point of the kingdom of God breaking into this world, the already not yet time. And we still await the rest of what has been promised. So I glory in all of those things, but I have to again go back to the plain meaning of Scripture. When we look at the subject of the fullness of the Gentiles, then we look in the rest of the Bible and see what is spoken, what is promised of the Gentile world. We look in Isaiah, the second chapter that the Messiah will settle disputes, or the Lord will settle disputes among the nations, provide arbitration for many peoples. This is at the end, in Hebrew, at the end of, of days. They will turn their swords into plows and their spears into pruning hooks. 
nation will not take up the sword against other nations and they will never again train for war. A passage I cited early in my presentation. Has that, that happened? No, absolutely, categorically not. You can read it in Hebrew or Greek or English. It has not taken place along with many, many other promises. Again, I encourage you, read through Isaiah 11 and ask, has that yet happened? Read through Isaiah 59, 60, 61, 62. Has that yet happened? Read right through to the end of the book of Isaiah. Has that yet happened? The answer, categorically, no. Jesus wept over the destruction of Jerusalem in Luke, the 19th chapter, because he said, you did not know the time of your visitation. In no way could that be construed as salvation, as no way could that be construed as the deliverer coming to and coming from Zion. And this is when God takes away Israel's sins. No, that's when Israel was severely judged for sins. And since we look at the other passages about fullness of the Gentiles, the final judgment of the nations, Matthew 25, which has not yet happened, the, the ingathering of people from every single language under the sun, which is still unfolding even as we speak. The fact that we agree that we should be going and preaching the gospel to all people. I say, hey, we're still fulfilling the Great Commission. I see no reason to place it back as something that has ceased, nor do I believe that the moving and gifts of the Spirit have ceased. They also continue. When we look at a passage like 1 Thessalonians 4, with all respect to Dr. Preston's scholarship, it doesn't take 12 hours to explain. Paul is comforting people who are grieving because of dead loved ones and saying, hey, we don't sorrow like others because they're going to rise from the grave. And he quite specifically deals with this at length in 1 Corinthians 15 to say just as you plant a seed, a physical seed in the ground, and then it comes up something else, the same thing, we're going to go down into the earth as a natural body and come up glorified as the Messiah. Doesn't it say in 1 John 3, when we see him, we will be like him? Are we yet like him in that respect? No. We are being conformed to his character spiritually, but are we yet like him? No. That is something that we fervently look forward to. And, and Paul actually, in, in Philippians, the third chapter, speaks as well of the transformation of this physical body, physical, bodily resurrection still to come, a cardinal truth of the New Testament. And yes, we will be caught up to meet the Messiah in the clouds and escort him back to the earth. And lastly, I see nothing in Torah language that says that times of the Gentiles is a specific Torah curse and can only apply in that way. And in closing, Ma uh, Jeremiah 31, explicit, there is a new covenant, but not a new people. God says there the covenant is with Israel and Judah, and Paul says that that covenant remains because of God's eternal love for the patriarchs, Romans 11, 28, and 29. Therefore, the law, which comes after Galatians 3, cannot undo the promise. The promise remains, and God will fulfill every single word he spoke through the prophets. Watch and see. It's still to come. Thank you. Dr. Brown, excellent job by both of you men. This has been an outstanding uh, debate. It has been an outstanding display of character and respect for each other and respect for our audience today. We appreciate this and we hope that it will go down in the annals of debating history as one of the uh, really stellar examples of how we can come together and study the Word of God. So thank you, gentlemen. Thanks to our audience. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you.